Yes, I've been sewing since I was seven, but that doesn't mean I paid attention. Hello everyone! Welcome to another video with me, Stephanie Canada, the owner of Backroom Finds. Stop, 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 stop. Well, hello folks. Welcome to Sewing Face Stephanie. So, the thing is, I had a whole other introduction planned for today uh, that I had recorded, I don't know, about a month ago. And due to the Black Lives Matter movement, plus just general insensitivities coming out of the company that I had originally based the stress on, I decided to change things up a little. Now, the inspiration for this has not changed. This lovely dress is made from, well, is inspired by this lovely tablecloth. Now, there's one problem with this tablecloth. It has a racially insensitive motif, and I'm not comfortable putting it on a dress, and I'm not comfortable just sending these tablecloths as is out into the world because of this motif. So what I'm going to do is that on the next video, because this is part one of two, friends, and yeah, I needed to do this mock-up because I did. What I will be doing when I eventually make up these tablecloths is I am going to strategically place my pattern pieces so that none of the racially insensitive material goes onto the brand new made dress because it's the 21st century, friends. We don't need that. What I'll be doing with these motifs is I will be donating them to the Jim Crow Museum. If you have any questions about what that is, I will go ahead and link all their information down below for you. Now this video is part one of two because I did have to make a muslin fully before I got into cutting up the $100 tablecloths that I bought. Yeah, that's a thing that happened. So instead of starting off by cutting up very expensive and vintage tablecloths, I'm gonna start with six yards of this Joann's fabric from June of 2019. I hear you judging me. It's okay, I do too. Yep, friends, it's been a year since I bought this, and so it's time to use up this amazing 1930s reproduction cotton in my wearable muslin. And for the rest of the information, I'm gonna let my composed self finish it out. The pattern that I chose to use is Simplicity 3932. It's from the 1950s, and I have a bust size 44, which has a waist of 38. So thankfully for me, not too much adjusting has to be done. Yay! she says before she makes the mock-up so she doesn't actually know. And of course, no sewing journey would be complete without my trusty, handy, dandy, ever-present 1954 Singer Sewing Book. Yes, the one I made the satire video of. Because without this thing, I would probably be lost. But seriously, first-hand source material is going to be your best bet. If you're ever going in to try and make a 1950s pattern, it's always good to have a matching book Maybe not necessarily by the exact company, but just so that you have an exact period reference so that when the instructions inevitably confuse you, because there's barely anything there, you have your book to reference, just in case. So day one was an adventure. I had to start out by tracing out my pattern piece that had all the erasable ink in Sharpie. While doing this, I had no idea it was transferring to the cotton underneath, but here we go. Now I also realized that my pattern pieces had gotten re-wrinkled since the time I had originally ironed them, so I had to bust out the iron, or leave the iron busted out, as it were, so that I could continue to iron my pieces. It was also at this point that I realized I had not put the instructions back in the envelope. Which is really exciting because my office is a mess and I have no idea where they are. Well, never mind then, we're just gonna keep ironing and... Hopefully I'll remember where I put them. You especially have to be careful on pieces that have browning like this, because those are the ones that are liable to tear. Now I turned down the heat on my iron to the lowest setting to iron out this piece, just to make sure I wouldn't do any further damage to that piece. Hey look, here are some instructions. 
Now the layout I did go with was the closest to the 43 inch fabric that I had, so I opted for the 44 and just figured I'd wing it, because that's what I do. Now the interesting part for me is I am slightly larger than the measurements uh, as of <clears throat> some extra weight that has occurred in the last three months, but I'm double checking here to make sure that I really understand how the pieces go together and where I need to measure to make sure that I'm not going to completely bust out of this dress. Ah oh, yes, friends. And the life of a small YouTuber means you are in entirely one room, so here we have to reorganize a little bit so that I can lay my fabric on the floor to do all of the cutting. Oh yeah, maybe if I put the instructions on the floor and stare at them, I'll magically get an idea of how to do this. Remember folks, just because you sell vintage sewing patterns for a living doesn't mean you actually sew all that often. So it does actually take me quite a long time to do any of these projects. But it just goes to show you, you really shouldn't be afraid to sew because truly anyone can do it. It's gonna start off messy and it's not always gonna be perfect. Just wait till you see the back darts on this thing. But believe me, friends, you too can sew. If I can do it, anyone can. Now I am anal retentive and did have to relay this fabric over because I had originally laid it up with too much excess on top and I'm not one for wasting fabric. And of course I also had to repin the larger skirt piece because I had gotten some of that daggone selvedge that's white and ugly in it and, well, I'm too anal retentive to have that in there. But little did I know that the underside still had a little bit of white. Yay for a 5 8 inch seam allowance? Cool. That'll save it. Ah uh, yes, and they wanted me to cut two pieces of the back skirt, and um, I was lazy and didn't feel like doing that, so instead I laid them directly next to each other and made it one piece, because I didn't feel like dealing with it. And shockingly, it worked out quite well, so hooray for skipping a step. Or maybe it was supposed to be on the fold? I don't remember. I made it one piece, that's all I know. Now here's the interesting piece. They actually had me lay out the front piece on the fold and didn't tell me to cut along it specifically. It said cutting line, but on the other layouts, it always had it on the fold. So I assumed the part that was on the fold was the center front. <laughs> no, no friends. No, it was not. So the first thing I have to do on day two, well, the real day two, is cut that puppy right at the middle, which it all turned out fine. So it wasn't the end of the world. I did opt to use tailor tacks throughout all of this, but you'll see later where I apparently got lazy and forgot to do some. So I have to do it in the process of sewing, which is not ideal because you want to just keep sewing. You don't want to stop to do tailor tacks. Ah uh, yes, and those fun double gathering stitches, those are my favorite. I don't know why I keep picking projects that always have gathering, but it does look nice in the end. Stares blankly at instructions, hoping for enlightenment. Nope. All right, just keep going. So here I am gathering it so that it hits between the two medium dots. They describe them as medium and small dots, but there's no large, so I'm not really sure why they opted for medium and small. All right, 1950s pattern, that was a choice. 
Now, of course, the finicky bit of having to sew it to the other piece without the gathers looking like crap. Ah uh, yes, and of course, now you must get that ironing board back out of the hallway so that I can press all the seams up toward the yoke direction, as opposed to opening them flat like you normally would. And now I'm gonna sew that center front seam together. That's the actual center front, not where the fold was. And of course, pressing that open. The interesting thing about this pattern is that the facing is actually part of the main piece. So you don't have to do any extra sewing, you just gotta fold it over, which I thought was quite brilliant. Now, instead of doing extra seam binding, which I couldn't be bothered with on a mock-up, I just went ahead and sewed it over so that a quarter inch of the fabric was folded over to keep everything from fraying. And they said to do it along the long side and on the end. I'm not sure if they meant both ends because now that it's done, I feel like I should have done both ends, but choices were made. I did opt to clip that middle section there because otherwise it wasn't going to lay well. Well, I don't, it doesn't hurt it to my knowledge, so I guess it was a good choice. Then it's having me tack down that pointed front center to those seam allowances so that it doesn't wiggle around too much. I think I might actually tack down the facing bit as well, just because it's a little wonky and wiggly, but not right now. Right now we're just keeping going. Ah uh, yes, here they are. The tailor's tax I didn't do. Well, let's do that real quick. Are these proper tailor tax? No, because proper tailor tax you wouldn't cut in the center, but because it's a printed pattern as opposed to an unprinted pattern, you do have to leave yourself a little bit of a drag through room, wiggle through, I don't know. You have to be able to remove the pattern and I don't feel like punching a giant hole over where the dart is. So, it's a choice I made. Now you gotta cut apart those tailor tacks so that you know where you're going. And I did actually decide to do them in a contrasting fabric this time, so I wouldn't go blind trying to find them. See, I am learning, y'all. Oh yes, and now you get to see exactly how much I suck at doing darts. Not a single one of them is the same length. Yeah, I could use a tracing wheel, but I hate them and what they do to patterns, so I refuse. I probably should have used a ruler in my chalk in retrospect. <laughs> but like I said, choices were made, and here we are. Again. Just a mock-up. Probably I'll wear it around the house for giggles. Not really concerned about it. I'll care more when I get to the expensive stuff. On these darts, I did opt to do the drive it all the way off and then tie them method. Seemed to work all right. And because this is a truly lovely little 1950s pattern, instead of one giant dart, they did opt for two smaller darts. So. Two smaller darts I did. It actually helps line up the seams along the skirt, so in the end it actually did work quite well. If I get real fancy, I might try and do one dart next time so that one dart lines up with the seam 
But we'll see how excited I get when I make the real version. And this is why you shouldn't iron this late at night. I just fried my thumb with the iron. I'm just glad it was just warming up so it wasn't full blast high heat cotton just yet. And now comes the part where I stare at the fabric for a little bit. Because for some reason the darts don't line up. And I can't quite figure out why. So I did go into my trusty 1954 Singer sewing book to tell me a little bit more about it. It did not help, but what did was staring at the instructions for a little bit, where it says, join front yoke to bodice back at shoulder, easing back to fit between the notches. AKA, intentionally don't sew the seam flat because you want to have a little bit of a ripply effect. I don't fully understand why. I think it sort of looks a little on the messier side, but oh well, I did it anyway. But not before having to unpin and then repin everything because I didn't understand the first time and I thought it was just a misprint on the pattern. Or that I sucked at cutting. Both of which were viable options in that moment. So now that I've got that ease going, I am going to go ahead and sew that puppy together. And again, it's rolling with the punches time, because instead of doing what the instructions say to do, which is to join side seams below small dart, leaving left side open below the notch, which I thought I had done, but when I went to go put the skirt together, I realized I had indeed left the right side open. Which, it doesn't really matter, because at least I realized before I sewed anything. So, step forward because I realized before I did it and had to undo everything? I'll take that. Why not? So here we are for day two. I've got a vaguely completed bodice out of my Joann's cotton, and I will be delving into the skirt. And let's hope this goes better than the bodice did, preferably without burning my hand. Starting off day three, strong, I did opt to start by sewing the facing together and then doing that handy dandy one quarter inch stitch along the rounded side that did not have the notch instead of opting for the seam binding. Because again, mock-up, not really concerned. Oh, pinning this down was a fraptious joy, because there was no back center seam to be had, so I was just kind of measuring and hoping it wasn't too far to one side. I think I was only off by about an eighth of an inch, so I will call that a win. The little notches only vaguely lined up. I think I might have sewed over them a little too far, but I still sewed it on anyway.
Now I am making sure to press that seam allowance actually underneath the facing because I just watched Evelyn Wood's What is Understitching video, which I will link down in the description, y'all. It actually saved me a whole bunch of time ironing and a step that I always skipped because I just did. So she's really lovely. I've actually chatted with her a little bit and I truly enjoy her channel. She's the one you actually want to go learn from. Come watch me for all the mistakes I make and having to undo and redo things. If you want to learn proper sewing techniques in the vintage style, go watch her channel. She's lovely. She takes things very clearly, very slowly. She's great. I also figured the best time to try understitching was on a mock-up, so if I screwed it up, it wasn't the end of the world. Yeah, curves sort of suck for those. But the ones on the underarms went much smoother. Now I am opting to do a little bit of seam binding on the underarm here, which I'm using one and a half inch seam binding because that's what I have in the house. Also why it's tan and not black. But you just use what you have sometimes and just go with it. And once I have both those on, it, friends, it's time for a coffee because mama needs it. Now comes the real test of did I actually draft this corner correctly? Well, okay, not at first. At first we have to do all the tailors tacks on the gathering stitches because guess what else I didn't do? And I'm also using my erasable pen here just to extra mark things so that I can really straightly line these up so my gathers don't look like a hot mess. The best part about this though is that the gathering is supposed to go down to as tight as you can get it, which is two and a half inches for the cotton that I have, which is exactly what they asked for. Ain't that lovely. In the finished garment, I think it might pucker a little bit too far out just because of the type of fabric. But let's face it, you can only expect so much of Joanne's cotton. Now remember those basting stitches I did to do the gathering? Yep. I didn't realize until the very last seam of the skirt that it was still on the larger basting stitch. Now don't get too excited here, friends. The difference in my basting stitches is from a th size three to a size four, so it's not that different, but yeah.
Now here I am lining up the skirt pieces, judging myself on how well I did this corner when I drafted it out in my how to trace sewing patterns. And then I decided, no, no, I need a pocket. I decided to go whip out my Vixen by Micheline Pitt Spiderweb and Rose Dress because I love the size of that pocket. Some tracing paper, my erasable pen, and some scissors. And I got to town making myself a pocket piece. I originally cut out enough for two pockets and then unfortunately realized with that side entry for the closure, yeah, that other one wasn't gonna work, but that's okay. At least there is one pocket in this dress so that I can have some storage for the items that I like to carry around. Plus the Michelin dress has enough room for my janky 1990s Gigantor wallet. So yeah, I'm hoping this one fits the same way. Although the skirt isn't as full, so you might notice a little bit more of a bulge, but I don't really care. Making sure to sew those pockets in first before I sew the skirt pieces together. And I figured, why not? Let's do some more understitching just to see and some practice some more. These were much better than the first ones. Now we gotta pin all that together with the pocket looking like a little glove off to the side there. And of course, gotta check that bobbin for that bobbin roulette. How are you doing on it? So far, so good for me. Now I'm just going to go ahead and sew that entire thing together, making sure to dive down and around that pocket, making sure that I don't leave the opening too small or too big. Don't want things to fall out, but also would like to fit my very large hand in there. And now the taxing part. Pinning the skirt to the bodice. This made me so incredibly nervous. I kept having to adjust where the everything lies and are the seams lined up correctly because I'm anal retentive. I did have to do a little bit of extra easing in the front, which on the completion I'm not 100% sure if I like that. I might try and trim out a little excess at the beginning of the process as opposed to the end because there was just a little bit too much fluffiness for me, but the whole point of this was to see how the pattern fit without me adjusting it. So, great! Now I know. And now we actually have to get to the job of sewing it together. making sure I go ahead and press that entire seam allowance upward because I am actually gonna go through and do a top stitch here later. And now the fun part, friends. Everything is done so you can take out all of those ridiculous orange threads that are scattered around your entire dress. So this is the before, and this is the after. Ain't she pretty? And here's the completed dress. Is it actually done? No. No, it's not. Am I safety pinned into it? Yes. Yes, I am. But I don't care. Like I said, the bodice leaves a little bit to be desired. I feel like it's still a little big, or I could just wear a different undergarment. I did wear the smooshy bra as opposed to the voluptuous bra, so maybe just doing that will make it fit a little bit better. I do need to work on the waist a little bit. It feels a little high to me. It needs to go down a little bit, so maybe I just need to give myself a little bit of room for that extra squishy and um, all those cookies I've been making. I do enjoy my pocket, and I do actually like the gathers at the front 
Although I am concerned that with the tablecloth, it's not gonna work the way I want it to. So I might actually have to opt for a different skirt bottom for when I cut into the tablecloth that is more of a straight panel as opposed to the gathered panels. But we shall see when I get to that step. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed watching me make this dress today, including all the bumps and hiccups along the road, because I am not one to think that I am a perfect seamstress. Yes, I've been sewing since I was seven, but that doesn't mean I paid attention. Yeah, sorry, Mom. If you liked this video, go ahead and click that like button. And if you want to see more from me as I attempt to sew different things or just in general, go ahead and click that subscribe button. Go ahead and turn on that bell for post notifications because it'll go ding dong. No, it really won't. Thanks so much for watching, y'all. See y'all next time. Today's video is going to show... No, smile, Stephanie. All right, folks, I hope y'all enjoyed me watching... Me watching? me watching. Mainly because I'm terrified that I'm going to screw it up. And I don't want to do that because these were really expensive to begin with. So my original inspiration isn't going to change. I do truly love... Where did I put it? Oh god, come here. Come here. Not helpful.